Welcome to War Games and Toast, all of you lovely people. I am once again back talking about the latest edition of Warcry, and once again I am talking about the brand new Sundad Fates box. Last time I was talking about the Hunters of Huanchi, and this time I am going on about the Jade Obelisk and how they work, how to run them, their pros and cons, and a sample list will be at the end of the video just to give you an idea of what to do and how to build your models if you want to follow along. But before we get to all that, please consider dropping a like, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel. It all helps feed the YouTube algorithmic demon and helps the channel more than you could ever know. Let me know what you want to see next and I will try my darndest to make that a reality. But with all of that out of the way, let's get back to the video. So first things first, let us talk about who the Jade Obelisk are and their pros and cons on the battlefield. Well, firstly, the Jade Obelisk are people who really, really like Jade and are kind of following the Chaos God Zinch, who is the changer of ways, the master of fate and the god of magic. They are a hard hitting, tough, self-sustaining and very coordinated faction that requires some key models to be on the battlefield for the faction to work at all. On the negative side, the Jade Obelisk are very slow, they are very one note, they are incredibly dice heavy and like we said in the pros, they are coordinated. They require very specific models on the battlefield to function and if those models are killed, then a lot of your abilities stop working and the ones that stay active are not as effective. So every major loss in Jade Obelisk will hurt a little bit more than some other factions. Now to really understand the Jade Obelisk you need to look at their abilities because this is where everything all comes together and how the faction really gels. Obviously, quickly touching on the pros and the cons will give you a brief idea, but this is now for the much more in-depth look at how the Jade Obelisk actually work. So kicking it all off, we have their reaction, which is aptly named the Curse of Jade. This is one of the stronger defensive actions in the game, and unlike many other defensive actions of this kind, it specifically mentions critical damage. So what it does is, it reduces all hit and crit damage done by an attack action by one to a minimum of one. This is very strong. If you look at the likes of, say, Beastmen, they have a thing called Brute Resilience. This is very much the same thing. However, where most of these abilities fall flat is that either by error or by design, it's not entirely sure yet, those abilities don't often, if ever, mention critical damage, where, whereas the Curse of Jade specifically mentions critical damage, which means you are definitely, no matter what, getting that reduction, regardless of interpretation. It is on ink, it, on the paper, it is there. You will get the, the reduction, and that reduction is very good. This makes all of your models much harder to shift, but the downside of this reaction is that a lot of the models in Jade Obelisk, as we will see, have a lot of value in their activations. They value using their activations to hit things in the head really hard. Which means there's not many models that really want to use this reaction and burn the AP. Now, of course, you'll want to use this reaction if you suspect you're going to die. Then, of course, you would much prefer to stay alive with just one AP than being dead with no AP. So it's very powerful, but because of the faction, you might not use this as much as you might initially think. Now, you do need to bear in mind that this reaction only works against melee attacks. So if someone was to shoot you in the head with a, I don't know, a cannon, <laughs> you aren't going to be able to react with Cursor Jade, which means that you are slightly more vulnerable to range attacks, but thankfully in Warcry, range attacks as a whole are uh, fairly weak. There aren't many really strong range attacks. 
a lot of them are from bows or fairly weak 1-3, maybe 1-4 damage weapons. And a few that are really high-end that in terms of damage, you're not going to encounter them all that often. It's, just, it's not going to really matter. With the reaction out of the way, it is time to look at the actual abilities. And we're going to start off with our doubles. And our first double is going to be Stone Warp. Any fighter can use this ability, which makes it very powerful. As long as that fighter is within 9 inches of a model with the Jade Obelisk and Icon Bearer Rune Mark, they can heal half the value of the ability dice spent on the ability. In addition, if they are also within 6 inches of a model with the Jade Obelisk and Priest Rune Mark, then they can heal flat dice damage. This ability is very interesting. Um, I find this ability to be very, very interesting. And it highlights the need to have a lot of setup and a lot of support for the Jade Obelisk to work. You need two models on the board in close proximity to use this reaction on a third model. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of bonkers. It's kind of bonkers, and it's a little bit awkward to read from the card, um, but it is very powerful. There are a lot of healing abilities in Warcry, and these abilities typically require some sort of trigger. So, for example, Dragon Ogres can heal if a Dragon Ogre Shagoth heals them with a large AoE blast, and that requires a character to burn AP to do that or burn ability dice on their activation, which is an AP, to do that. Or say, let's look at another one, a heal on kill. You need to kill something to gain a heal. This one requires none of that, and the entire faction can use it. Everything from basic troops to characters, all the way to your weird totemy, dragony thingy. All of them can use this. And because they can heal flat dice damage, it's really strong. You can have a lot of sustain with this, and since it's an ability, it doesn't require AP. You can heal and then still attack and move and whatnot. The only downside is you need your characters alive. If your Icon Bearer rune marked character dies, then you can no longer use Stone Warp on anyone. If your Priest rune marked character dies, then the heal is substantially weakened. So bear all that in mind, when you start throwing your guys into combat, you could lose a vital piece and completely shut off one of your biggest forms of resilience, your self-sustain. The next double is one that I have issue with, and I'll go into it, but I'll describe it first. It's called Hammering Strike. This can only be used by defacers who have melee weapons. Uh, you can only use this ability if you have dealt damage with the fighter you want to activate hammering strikes with during this activation. You can then increase your damage and crit damage by half the value of the dice you spent. This on paper looks staggeringly powerful for a double. Okay, Defacers with melee weapons are strength 4. They get 4 attacks, and they are minimum damage 2, critical damage 3. When buffed with a 5 or a 6, you are going to minimum damage 5, critical damage 6, with 4 attacks. That is a humongous increase in power. And it's an increase that's not to be taken lightly. This will do a lot of damage on the right thing. The problem is Hammering Strike has so many hurdles before you can actually gain the benefit and oftentimes it's just not worth the investment. So here is out. The first hurdle, you have to have dealt damage in this activation already. This means you can't just move and attack in Hammering Strike because of course Hammering Strikes doesn't give you bonus attack action. You have to have that action ready. So you need to have you need to already be in combat to use it first things first. Secondly, you still need to deal damage. That's, again, not guaranteed. You're only strength 4. 
So against a lot of things that are like toughness 5 or even higher in some cases, you're not guaranteed to do that damage. Which is a big deal. If you can't do the damage, then you can't hammering strike. Bit of a big deal against tougher targets. Then the next hurdle, there's more hurdles. The next hurdle is determining if it's actually worth using. Okay, so it's risky to to use this on tougher enemies. So why not use it on weaker enemies? Well, the downside to that is weaker enemies have lower toughness, they have lower health. And your guy already has four attacks and minimum damage too. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that a defacer could pulverize your basic chaff enemy that you're intending to use this on without having to use hammering strikes or ham hammering strike. So where does this ability see use? And after much thought, it only really sees use against super high health targets who don't have a lot of toughness. So let's look at things like uh, many monsters are toughness 4. Minotaurs are toughness 4. Dragon Ogres are toughness 4. These are all things you are likely to get the first hit off and then you can then do a decent chunk of damage with Hammering Strike. Outside of this, it really isn't worth it. If you take this against a toughness 5 or above enemy, what's going to happen? You might score a hit. You likely score one hit. But because the hammering strike doesn't actually increase your strength, without using even more dice on later abilities, which we'll cover in a, in, in a little bit, you're still only going to do about seven damage. So with the best hammering strike ability spend you can do, you might do the two damage on the first hit and then the five damage on the second hit. But because they're super high toughness, you're going to miss most of those swings. So you really are going to cap at about around about seven damage. And that just isn't very good. Um, it's overkill on anything weaker. And it's not good enough on anything tougher, which makes it a very hard sell for me. I think it looks great on paper. But the more you dig into it, the less effective it seems. And of course, I forgot one last hurdle. It is dice dependent. You need a high double for this to work. If you only have a, you know, if you've rolled a, a, a double one or a double two, this is just not worth it. Even a double three or a double four, it's not really worth it. Um, you really are looking for those fives and those sixes to get the maximum benefit from it. And even then, you're not really getting much out of it. So hammering strike looks good. I don't think it's going to see much play in reality. The final double and the final nail in the coffin of Hammering Strike is actually Rock Shattering Blow. This can only be used by Desecrators. Now, these are the guys with the big two-handed hammers and the big two-handed pick. What this does is you add one to the strength, damage and critical damage of the next action performed. This is so much stronger than Hammering Strike, it's not even funny. The bonus strength allows the Desecrators to swing really hard. They're already toughness, they are already strength five. This brings them to strength six. Very few things have toughness six. Even fewer things have higher than toughness six. Straight away, most things you hit, you're now hitting on threes. Massive deal. Increase to damage and crit damage. It's only increased by one, but that is enough. This is just a straight, very powerful buff to an already very powerful model. And it has no hurdles. That's the thing. Hammering Strikes is clearly more damaging on the high end, but has too many hurdles to work. Rush, rock Shattering Blow, on the other hand, just comes in, any double will do, and it performs every time. And it performs on a model that is substantially more useful 
than the model that can use Hammering Strike. So out of the doubles, Rock Shattering Blow is beautiful and that is the one to really look out for. Now moving on to triples, we have Bloody Tribute. How this works is it's quite complicated. If your Priestess kills an enemy model, you can burn a triple of any value. You then pick a model anywhere on the board as long as that model is within nine inches of a jade obelisk icon bearer rune marked model and then they can immediately make a bonus move action this ability is very strange <laughs> it is incredibly convoluted um in its wording and it took me a couple of reads to understand what it was actually telling me to do and to be perfectly honest, the effect is not very good. Um, a bonus move action is beautiful, but the fact you have to kill something with your priestess to pull it off, not only that, the model you want to move has to be within a range of a third very specific model. It, ju it just seems too complicated. And the fact that it's a triple... It's a triple, and the fact that the Priestess is really bad in combat, this just isn't going to happen without a lot of setup, and I mean a lot of setup. It's very convoluted, the payoff isn't good enough for the amount of, again, hurdles you need to jump, and the biggest weakness is that it requires three models. You still need the Priestess to be alive to get the kill. You need a fighter who you want to activate and then that fight and needs to be in range of a jade obelisk icon bearer so if that icon bearer dies you just can't use bloody tribute <laughs> so again it's very interesting mechanically it's very interesting needing to have the priestess and the icon bearer work in tandem for now two abilities is very cool the issue being that this ability isn't as good as Stone Warp. So will you use Bleed Tribute? Maybe. Is it worth going out of your way to pull it off? Not really. Unless it's going to win you the game like in a later turn. Bloody Tribute just isn't going to come up very often. I don't think it's very good. And as I'll talk about later on, it really does put the f like a bit of a nail in the coffin of the priestess model um this is a unique ability and it's terrible <laughs> it's just not good so mm, we'll, we'll go over it later on with the breakdown of the priestess but this ability not a fan not a fan at all thankfully <laughs> thankfully the next triple does save the cake somewhat this is called the gaze of the idol arc and this can only be used by the eponymous idol arc so you pick a visible enemy fighter within nine inches then you subtract half the value of you of your dice from either the movement or toughness characteristic of that model until the end of the battle round this is quite possibly one of the strongest abilities I've seen in Warcry for a long time. If you compare this to other comparable triples, say Petrifying Gaze on the Cockatrice, or anything that lowers movement, it tends to only lower movement by one. Just the one. This reduces movement by three, up to three. This can completely neuter just about anything you touch with it anything that's average movement which by the way is four is basically out of action for the next turn they can't do anything they can move two whole inches that turn four if they pop their own double for rush like this could be devastating and that's just the movement side the toughness side the toughness side of this ability is also staggeringly powerful Things with high toughness. Let's look at, let's say, Annihilators. Okay, Annihilators are the go-to toughness tank boys of Warcry. These things have toughness 7. Not anymore. You drop them at toughness 4. Average toughness in the game is 4. They're now toughness 1. 
if you've got the maximum gaze the idol are going off you know the down to toughness one it is very few characters in the game have higher than toughness five you can take a toughness five character and reduce them to toughness two and this means that everything in the game can just wail on these characters this is an assassination ability you can kill anything in the game with this you can make everything vulnerable for a whole battle round and you can effortlessly kill them this can make archers which we will go into in, in a bit surprisingly effective because the toughness reduction is just that potent gaze of the idol arc is staggering i can't get over how powerful this can be in game from combat to movement to shenanigans you can do so much and you can, you will you will absolutely win games with this ability the only downside to this ability is it is tied to the idol arc and the idol arc is not a particularly tough model if the idol arc dies then this ability goes with it so there is a, a sense of risk versus reward here but if you can keep that idol arc alive you can severely punish your opponent's attempts to do anything it is very very good and the final ability we have is the might of the speaker so you pick a visible friendly fighter within a number of inches equal to the value of the ability so far so good add three to this value if a jade obelisk priest model is anywhere on the battlefield so again we've got a little bit of um you know priest icon bearer synergy coming in again here the chosen fighter can then make up to two bonus move actions bonus attack actions or bonus disengage actions in any combination and this ability can only be used by the icon bearer unit so the icon bearer selects something else nearby and then they can go on a bit of a rampage now this is a quad and as far as quads go this is ridiculously stupidly powerful this is your generic quad dialed up to ludicrous levels this can be used to all kinds of in all kinds of ways you can be tactical you can get bonus movements you can do all kinds you can use this to yeet models across the board or take an objective and then yank them back with increased movement this could be used to allow a model to attack four times this is stupidly good and especially on the super high end of the spectrum you can put this on a desecrator who has minimum damage three and then you can just go to town you can lay waste to enemies and no matter what they are it doesn't matter how tough they are you come in with might of the speaker and they will probably be, they will probably be dead it is crazy good and should be used over the generic quad in the core rulebook almost 100 percent of the time the only time you can't use this is if you have lost your speaker or if the model that needs to get the buff is too far away from the icon bearer so th again the usual jade obelisk hurdle once again crops up and that it requires priests the icon bearer and to be within bubbles of both or in a, in a sense a bubble of just one of them uh, because the priest can be anywhere to gain the benefit so it's definitely a three model combo to pull it off like half of the abilities here but unlike bloody tribute this one is incredibly good this is the reason you take the icon bearer because the icon bearer as we'll discuss later on isn't a character there's very little reason to take the icon bearer for its stats because there's better things to hit with and then you realize oh wow okay yeah might the speaker this is fantastic we need this <laughs> it is really really good um so yeah very powerful and with all of the abilities well and truly out of the way let us go on to models of course abilities can be as strong as they want to be 
but if you don't have the models to back them up and to use them, you aren't going to get very far. Thankfully, there are a lot of fairly powerful models in the Jade Obelisk, but one of the models that is not that, <laughs> that is most certainly not that, is the Nephrite Priestess. She is your leader and is the focus of many of your abilities in battle, but she herself is very, very poor in combat. She comes with movement 4, toughness 3, 20 wounds. Okay, so very squishy. 20 wounds is standard, toughness 3, that is not standard, that is below what you'd expect. She has a 1 inch range attack, 4 attacks, 3 strength, 1 4 damage. For a leader, she is pitifully weak. She is below on just about every stat. Her attacks, her number of attacks are fine, but the strength, the damage, her toughness, the range, all terrible. Now this is traded off by her cost. She's only 105 points, making her one of the cheaper leaders in the game. So at that price, you can't really expect a, a physical or defensive powerhouse. And she really is a support piece. A lot of abilities rely on her. It's just a shame that she herself is not very good. Her unique ability, bloody tribute, is terrible. Her stats are terrible. You need to keep her safe and alive. Otherwise, you are going to struggle to use Stone Warp. You're going to struggle to use Might of the Speaker. She's very important, but she is made of glass and most certainly not made of jade. That's for sure. Now, the guy who really leads the warband is not actually a character. It is the Obelisk Bearer. This guy is only movement 3, toughness 4, and look at this, 20 wounds. This guy is much closer in terms of defensive stats to your standard boxed, bespoke Warcry leader. Uh, he's fairly tough, tough as 4, 20 wounds, that is absolutely the standard. His movement 3 is a bit on the hmm side, he's very slow, but he does have a giant rock on his back. You can't expect him to be running around the battlefield when he's being weighed down by the weight of literal jade. Now his offensive stats are also fairly on par with what you'd expect in a bespoke warband. So he has 4 attacks, strength 4, 2, 4 damage at a range of only 1. So in combat he's fine. He's, he's fine, he will kill chaff, he probably won't do much against anything tougher than that, he isn't going to be able to take on characters for the most part, but you know he can go toe to toe with a, a fair number of things. He is not a combat character, but he is certainly capable in combat if he ever gets there, and he has just enough toughness to stick around which is very nice since he also is required in many, many abilities. If he dies, then a lot of your faction just gets shut down. So very important to keep him alive and thankfully it shouldn't be too hard. But do bear in mind that movement three, he is very aura based. He needs to be close to things. He could be left behind. So you may have to consider using things like rush to get him up the board and within range to do his job. So bear that in mind. But he is only 110 points. So again, very cheap. He's very, very cheap for what he brings to the table. Excellent character overall. Definitely on the, the upper echelon of the Jade of the Jade Obelisk there. And the final of the more unique models in the Jade Obelisk is the Idol Arc. This thing is very fast. Movement 8 with flight. Toughness 3. And only 8 wounds. It's 105 points. Which is very expensive. And it's stat line is definitely not <laughs> worth. It's, it's stat line is definitely worth that cost. But of course he does bring his very powerful ability. And that 105 points is absolutely worth it. For the power of that ability. In terms of his offensive profile. Range 1. 3 attacks. Strength 3. 1. 3 damage. This thing can't kill anything. Uh, in combat, it's going to be a wet noodle. It's going to die far too quickly. And yeah, you want to keep it, you know, at that 9-inch range at all times. Keep it away from combat. Make sure it can, it's in range, the, the, the maximum range it can possibly be to use Gears of the Idol Arc. But you want to keep this away from archers. Keep it away from combat. And keep it as safe as possible. This is not a combat character. It's a beast. 
so it can't pick up, up any objectives. It can do ley lines, it can do quarters, so it can do some objective play and this movement will help with that, but its primary thing should be to stay alive and get ready to pop that gaze of the idle arc when needed. And now we get to the meat and the potatoes of the Jade Empire. We've talked about all the unique characters and the, the leader and the weird the weird bits of the faction. Let's look at the, the standard stuff now. So defacers, we have two variants. We have archers and we have defacers who have stone cutting tools. They are both the same cost, 95 points, and they share all the same defensive stats. So movement four, toughness four, and 10 wounds. This is incredibly solid. In terms of what points cost, you know, 95 points, that's a solid stat line um, for the cost. In terms of their combat profile, the melee variant is only range one again, four attacks, strength four, and a very unusual two, three damage profile. Whereas the ranger, the ranger, the archer variant is got two profiles. So he's got a 15 inch, a 15 inch range bow, two attacks, strength three, one, three damage, and a fairly piddly melee profile of three attacks, strength three, one, three damage. The defacers are interesting and I don't know if I'm alone in this. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how the rest of the Warcry community reacts to Defacers and whether or not this is a correct opinion. I think Defacers are bad. I'm going to put it right up there. I don't think Defacers are good enough. They are ex not. They are not overly expensive, but what they bring to the table isn't good enough. Um, the archers, they don't have any abilities tied to them uniquely, so they are just basic archers with nothing special. Your stone tool people, again, these guys, they have an ability, it's hammering strikes, it's not good enough, I don't like it. And sure, their movement 4 and toughness 4, they're fairly resilient, but man, there's, there's better things in this faction. And if I was to cut anything from the base box and replace it with, say, allies or thralls or monsters, it would be these guys. These guys are the first things to get cut. I don't think they're good enough. Um, do I think 2-3 damage profile is interesting? Yes. Minimum damage 2 is always good. The critical damage being 3 is interesting. It's clearly been balanced on hammering strike, which isn't very good. So... Mm. And then the archers. <sighs> archers. Well, they're good in the sense that the Jade Obelisk has no range. You may have noticed nothing in this box so far has a range greater than one. One inch. And spoiler, nothing in this faction has a melee range of higher than one inch. And half the faction only moves three inches. So... Having a 15 inch range bow can help you assert presence across the board and that shouldn't be underestimated and if comboed with the idle arc to reduce a key target's toughness then being able to fire you know you get four you get up to four archers in this box I think so you know that's four shots per archer four times four 16 shots and you are likely going to wound you could probably, if you're lucky, assassinate a weaker character, you know, a 20 wound character. You could probably assassinate with a combo of like a firing squad of archers plus the gears of the idol arc. Um, and that's probably where I would try and fit them as a assassination sniper force almost because otherwise they're not very good. Bows aren't pretty good in Warcry. These guys don't have the movement speed to be properly harassing Harry, Harry-ish, if that makes sense. And the melee variant, I don't think it's good enough. I don't think they've got enough support and the support they have isn't good enough. So, if anything, maybe take archers um, or cut them entirely. That would be my, my advice. The box, I believe, is trying to push you to take two of each. And if you're just starting, two of each would probably be a solid bet. If all you have is Jade, is this Jade Obelisk set, then having a variety of models is probably better than just taking a, a mono slant, like what I'm, I was suggesting with the shooting squad. 
I would build two of each. This would give you a much more balanced force on the table and it'll give you a bit more wiggle room for mistakes. But if you're going to expand beyond this, I would say the faces, unless they're archers, uh, are probably going to get cut. And the main reason for that, the main reason for that <laughs> is because desecrators exist. For five points more, you can take a desecrator. And desecrators are better in every way. Almost. So they're movement three. That's the, that's the downside out of the way. They are movement three. Very, very slow. But they have got 12 wounds, not 10. And they retain toughness four. So they're quite tough. They're hard to shift. They are tougher than your... So chaff will have between eight and 10 wounds. These things are tougher than chaff slightly and when combined with their reaction curse of jade they are incredibly tough they are deceptively tough but where they shine where they shine is in their attacks now bearing in mind these are still only one inch range but you have the hammer which comes in with three attacks strength five minimum three damage with a crit of five or the pick which again range one Four attacks, strength five, minimum damage two, crit damage five. Desecrators are brutal. I think these are going to be the backbone of the Jade Obelisk. These are going to be taken all three every time. You might even buy more because they are so solid. For a hundred points, these have a fantastic damage profile. They are very slow. Do bear that in mind, you can be kited, you could spend the entire game chasing things, but if you can get on, on a point or a key objective location, enemies will have to eventually come to you. You can use that to your advantage because you will be able to trade with most things very favourably, especially with Rock Shattering Blow Active. Bearing in mind that your pick goes to strength 4 attacks, strength 6, 3, 6 damage. And your hammer goes to three attacks, strength six, four six damage. The odds of you killing a chaff model in a single activation is basically guaranteed. The chances of you doing in one act in one AP is very high. <laughs> you could kill two models a turn with this quite easily. With might of the speaker, you can ensure you get into combat because of the double move you could even potentially kill three models with this if you got lucky enough and you got into combat with three chaff models at once these guys are very very potent and when it comes to the maths it doesn't matter which one you bring statistically because they share the same strength value of five or six depending on buff or not they're actual average damage is almost identical so uh the two five or the three five damage it doesn't matter uh one has four attacks one has three it really doesn't matter the averages are all the same so pick one that looks cool um our personal preference would be to build in the box two with picks and one with hammer i think the picks have more potential because they have that increased chance to spike with more crits because of the more dice being rolled which gives it a higher maximum damage threshold even if the average damage is the same so i would go with more picks than hammers but i wouldn't keep the hammer out of the list i would definitely take one hammer and the best part is they're both 100 points you don't pay more points to bring either weapon choice so desecrators are definitely the highlight of this box they are a very strong unit defacers not so much and okay the unique characters all three of them the priestess the icon bearer and the idol arc they're all fine the priestess is the easiest loser of that bunch but you know they're all fine and when taken as a whole the jade obelisk are very strong i've had a lot of negative words to say about the individual pieces of the jade obelisk so you know hammering strike being a bit crap bloody tribute being a bit crap um <laughs> the priestess the deface as being mm, you know but overall don't let that 
you know, those little tinges of negativity detract from the power of the Jade Obelisk. I think this faction will be very strong on the table, especially with a bit of practice, especially with ally support, which we will definitely cover in a later video, um, because you can put in things like Furies, Chaos Hounds, Chaos Spawn, and yeah, with Chaos Spawn, all these, you know, uh, harp uh, Harpies, Furies, you can really make up for that lack of movement and you can have a real presence on the board that is then backed up by some really heavy hitting infantry. There's a lot of fun to be had here. A lot of list crafting shenanigans, shall we say. And Jade Obelisk, very strong. But that's the, that's the models out of the way. It is time to discuss our list. So for our list, we have two that we would suggest you take. And this is just coming from the direct box itself. We're not going to throw in allies or thralls or monsters because that's for another video. That's a more advanced list building thing. This is entirely going off the back of Sundead Fate and what you can do with the Sundead Fate box. So first things first, we're going to bring the Nephrite Priestess, the Obelisk Bearer and the Idol Arc. These are always going to be an inclusion in any list regardless of allies, thralls, monsters, you will take these three models 100% of the time because the faction does not work without them. On top of that, we would take two Desecrators with Iconoclast Warpick and one Desecrator with a Statue Smasher Hammer, two Defacers with Antithite Antithite Bow and two Defacers with Stone Cutter Tools. This list is your standard list that you would take, and it's fairly strong. It's it's solid. You'll have a bit of range with bows. You'll have a lot of strong melee focus with the defacers and the desecrators, and providing you keep your models close together, or at least close to the key models in your army, you'll be fine. You want to focus on using your incredible melee strength and your very high sustain to get across the board. You have stone warp, you can heal up any chip damage. You can very easily keep your models alive with just doubles. As long as your models are close to key targets, you can heal up effortlessly. Once you're in combat, this is where the damage spiking begins. Use rock shattering blow, use might of the speaker, use gaze of the idol arc. These can help you do ginormous chunks of damage and you really want to throw away the idea of trying to stay alive because once you're in combat, the enemy is definitely, in most cases, going to be at a disadvantage. Your, your guys are very strong. They are very tough. And providing you didn't take too much damage coming in and you could heal, then you're going to be coming into combat at very high speed very high resilience and able to deal a staggering amount of damage especially with desecrators if you can get them in and with might of the speaker there's no reason why you can't our second list is again it'll be, it'll be mostly the same and we've discussed it before so again we'll have the nephrite priestess the obelisk bearer and the idol arc we need this then we'll take the same spread of uh, desecrators so two with iconoclast war picks and one day statue smasher hammer and then we will take four defacers with the antithete or antithite bows. This list has less of a melee presence. You only have three models that can fight in melee, but those three models are quite potent. The desecrators are very powerful. So if you get into combat, you can probably kill most of the things you touch. The strength of the list comes from the gaze of the idol arc combination with the defacers with antithite bows. This combination, I think, could be a bit of a... I wouldn't say secret or hidden. I think it could be an overlooked tactic to do a lot of damage from a long range. The Gaze of the Idolark ability to reduce things, to things by up to three toughness is very powerful. Even reducing toughness by one or two is enough to make your bows a seriously deadly threat. The threat of those bows with only one to three damage is very, very high. When the targets you're firing at only have a toughness of 
one or two or even three you can do a lot of damage you can chip away and of course the more arrows you're firing the more chance to spike those crits and that's always nice and don't forget you can use might of the speaker you can might of the speaker one of your archers and you can attack more times with your bows you can attack you can fire off up to four more arrows if you really wanted to is this going to be a shooty list no absolutely not but you could have the idlark and the archers working as one unified well unit and doing range shenanigans and all that nonsense whilst your icon bearer your desecrators are moving up the board to smash it people's faces in and it's a bit of a dual threat will it be good i don't know i think building them this way is more of a risk i think there's more of a risk that this will not pan out because it's very dice dependent you do need that triple and a high triple is ideal so it's not guaranteed you'll pull this off every turn it's not even guaranteed you'll pull it off every game but i think there's some play here and plus it'll give you that range that this warband really lacks and i think the four archers could be could be interesting so if you want to build them a little bit differently build four archers go all out be a little bit tricky with it if not stick to the standard 2-2 spread you should be fine um and yeah J Obelisk, there you have it it's a fun time so that's it for me today that is the J Obelisk. what do i think of the jade obelisk overall well when i was writing this script i was very much full of praise and then when i came to actually read it out <laughs> <laughs> I realised there was more negatives than I thought. And do I think they're good? I think they're very good. I think that they are a little bit awkward. But I think their playstyle is very interesting because it requires it's using, again, like with the Hunters of Huanxi, it's using mechanics and systems and rules in a way we haven't seen before. And if we have seen them before, we haven't seen much of it's a very interesting direction that Warcry is taking and I am all for this. Jade Obelisk are very interesting on the tabletop. They've got great models and with the Hunters of Huanxi, this is definitely a direction for Warcry I am happy to take. I loved Heart of Gur, but the Rotmire Creed and the Horns of Hushut were nowhere near as interesting as mechanically or in terms of models as the um jade obelisk or the hunters so this is a fantastic set this is a great faction and i am i will have to come back and touch on these guys again and the hunters and give some thoughts on potential allies thralls and little ways to build more unique lists but i really didn't want to go beyond the scope of this is sundered fate let's you know let's talk about the new models let's not go out of our way to throw models away so early you know let's let's get at least get the set built and how to build the set before we start cutting things and heating things out the window and replacing them with an ogroid myrmidon or a mind eater spheranx you know let's not do that straight away let's have a bit of time for it to settle you know but yep that is it from me today as always please consider leaving a like a sub and a comment it helps the channel and if there's anything else you want to see, let me know. If there's any improvements to the format, let me know. I'm still learning. I think, I like to hope, the videos are of a higher quality than they were when I first started a few videos back. I think there's improvements coming on. And yeah, let me know. Anything I can do to change, I will help. Will help. I will try to change. Um, but until then, you absolute legends. I'll catch you later.